Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our friend, Dr. Ellen Berger. Uh, we're continuing our series of workshops on emotional sobriety. Uh, Dr. Berger has spoken to our group for a year now, uh, every Monday, first Monday of the month. And tonight, he's going to continue to explore his book, Essential Insights for Emotional Sobriety, with the 11th Insight. And that 11th insight is living a purposeful life. Pretty good start to the, a new year, isn't it? Uh, with insight 11, uh, living that purposeful life, Dr. Berger shows how practicing recovery principles, in particular, the principle of service to others, brings purpose and meaning into our lives and connects us to our true nature. The 12 steps return us to our true self and inspires self-actualization, integration, and wholeness. So here we go. Alan, take it away. It's so good to see you again. Happy New Year. Well, Happy New Year, Susie. And it is interesting, isn't it, that we're starting off the new year with living life or living a purposeful life. And what a perfect time for that, right? Is that a time when some of us sit down and reflect and try to make some kind of a New Year's resolution, um, most of which we never follow up on or we start and we don't complete. But hopefully what we'll talk about tonight will, if you haven't thought about this in your life, that you'll integrate an awareness of the importance of this and more important, take some action to integrate the ideas here because they are essential um, to developing a practice of emotional sobriety. So without further ado, let me share my screen with you. Can everybody see that okay, Susie? Okay, thumbs up. Well, as Susie mentioned, this is the 12th uh, we're, we're exploring the 12 essential insights for emotional sobriety, and this is insight number 11, living life with a purpose. These are all taken from the book, 12 essential insights for emotional sobriety, getting your recovery unstuck. Um, this is my most recent book uh, on the topic. So I like to begin all these discussions by it, taking some time to understand emotional sobriety um, it, it's, it's a very simple phrase, but it's a very complex experience and concept. And so there are a lot of many different dimensions or textures to emotional sobriety. Um, I like to think about each of the essential insights as a different dimension or texture of emotional sobriety. And here we are now, we've come a long way. And if you have not listened to the previous um, presentations I've made on this, they are all available on the WhatsApp. Um, um, what would you guys call it? Community or files that you guys have available for you to go back and dig into this, as well as a lot of great talks by a lot of other fantastic professionals that have a lot to contribute to you know, our well-being, and even to the practice of emotional sobriety. But let's think of emotional sobriety as a, a practice that transforms a consciousness that is exclusive, intolerant of differences, very much based on absolute, things are either right or wrong, very inflexible consciousness, and moves us in the direction of a consciousness that is more inclusive. It doesn't create an us versus them attitude. It's like embracing all of our fellows, right? And understanding that that bumper sticker I saw, please be patient with me. God isn't finished with me applies to all of us, right? All of us are, are in the process of unfolding and evolving in, in, in our lives. So it creates a consciousness that's inclusive, less absolute, we live to we learn to live in the great palette of life, more flexible, and definitely respectful of differences. This kind of consciousness ultimately creates a consciousness of emotional freedom. 
So we can also think of it in this way from another perspective that emotional sobriety is a practice that moves us beyond the I'm okay if consciousness. I'm okay if things turn out the way that I'd like them to turn out. I'm okay if things turn out the way they should turn out, the way they're supposed to turn out into a consciousness that's an I'm okay even if consciousness. That's a consciousness that is not based on these contingencies. That's more unconditional. This creates a consciousness of emotional autonomy. I really love to think about emotional sobriety as creating an experience of autonomy in our life. I think it's a very important way to look at emotional sobriety. Suddenly, I realized what the matter was. My basic flaw had always been dependence, almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to supply me with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to my perfectionist dreams and specifications, I had fought for them. And when defeat came, so did my depression. So here was the insight that Bill had about what the matter was. His basic flaw had always been dependence. He called it almost absolute dependence here. Later on in this letter that he wrote that became an article or in the 1958 grapevine, he called it emotional dependency. He saw that this almost absolute dependence on people or circumstances to, to provide him with prestige, security, and the like. Failing to get these things according to his, he calls it perfectionist dreams and specifications. Well, let's spend a minute on understanding this. I'm okay if consciousness. So early on in our life, we came up with an idea of how things had to be for us to be okay. That was a decision made very early on in our life that was continued to be reinforced by additional ideas as our cognitive abilities developed. But when we decided that if I can become this idealized version of myself, then life is going to work. As soon as we set that into play, as soon as we now dedicated our lives to actualize a concept of who we should be, rather than to actualize who we really are, that's where the problem came in. That idealized image was out of necessity perfectionistic. We had to be that way to be okay. In my first book on emotional sobriety, 12 Smart Things to Do When the Booze and Drugs Are Gone, I used the metaphor of a bonsai tree because the bonsai artist really tries to create that tree in the image of perfection that he has in mind. And in order to achieve it, he has to now mutilate that tree to become what he wants it to be. He has to restrict its growth in certain areas, encourage growth in other areas. All kinds of things happen where he has to control that growth of that tree so it lives up to his ideal in terms of what he thinks it should look like. Well, we do the same thing to ourselves. Maybe not as artistically as the bonsai master, I think we leave a lot of rough edges to, to this whole thing. But that's where these perfectionist dreams and specifications come from. So that image is just riddled with shoulds. In fact, Dr. Karen Horney says we become terrorized by these shoulds. These shoulds begin to run our life. And we are okay if we live up to the way we should. She calls that false pride. And if we don't live up to that, we to these shoulds, then we hate ourselves and we punish ourselves to get back in line with what we should think we should be. Well, it makes sense that later on in life, we're not only going to have these shoulds for ourselves, but we're going to also project those shoulds into our environment, 
into our relationships. We're going to put the shoulds on other people. These become the unenforceable rules that each and every one of us has in our life. When things don't go the way that we want them to, some of us fight for them. Some of us just retreat and give up. There's a lot of different responses to that defeat. But what Bill did is he fought for them. And when he got defeated, when things didn't go his way, all he could do was feel depressed. Emotional sobriety gives us an alternative to being discouraged by things not going our way. That's the good news. There wasn't a chance of making the outgoing love of St. Francis a workable and joyous way of life until these fatal and almost absolute dependencies were cut away. Because I had over the years undergone a little spiritual development, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies had never before been so starkly revealed. Well, I love what Bill says here, is that he realized is that he could not have the experience in his life that he wanted to have. Talked about using the outgoing love of the St. Francis prayer, you know, the vision of that, a workable and joyous way of life until he was able to surrender these fatal and almost absolute dependencies. And I think it's very true, because until we see these things, until we, until we cut the string, so to speak, on our dependencies, we can't be free. We're going to continue to be controlled by them. Now, I love what he says. Because of his spiritual development, he, the absolute quality of these frightful dependencies were revealed to him. He was able to get honest with himself. I say this all the time, only the best in you can see the worst in you. Only the best in you can see where you're stuck, where you're still immature, where you still need to develop. That is nothing to be ashamed about. But you see, if we use our, our idealized self as the measure we're going to end up feeling like we're falling short if we're still uh, unfolding and incomplete. I have come to believe that this emotional dependency is not a pathology. It's just an arrested development. We all start out incredibly dependent, in fact, absolutely dependent, when we're in our mother's womb. We need that mother to provide us with everything in our life. And the minute we're born, we start the never-ending journey towards self-actualization or differentiation. <clears throat> we take our first act towards taking care of ourselves is learning to breathe for ourselves. No longer depending on our mother to provide us with oxygen and to take care of the carbon dioxide that builds up. It's our job to do it. Inhale, exhale. First thing we do. Now, isn't it interesting that almost every spiritual practice is based on what? Learning to breathe, right? Keeping a full breath, paying attention, grounding yourself in your breath. The reason we're grounded in our breath because it reminds us that this is my job. It's my job to take care of myself in this way. It's my job to breathe oxygen in and blow out the carbon dioxide. That's what I need to do to support myself. And that's just the first step towards a lifelong process of differentiation and self-actualization. It gets more complicated if only life could be as simple as breathing in and breathing out. But later on in life, that, that learning to differentiate ourselves is as important to our life as breathing was the first experience we had with our birth. It's exciting stuff. Reinforced by what grace I could secure in prayer, I found I had to exert every ounce of will and action to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people, upon AA, indeed upon any act or circumstance whatsoever. Then could I be free to love as Francis did. 
emotional and instinctual satisfactions I saw were really the extra dividends of having love, offering love, and expressing love appropriate to each relation of life. So you see his commitment. He had to exert every ounce of will and action. He had to make it a commitment, and he had to set his intention to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies upon people. That makes sense, right? Upon AA, that surprises people when they hear it. I thought that, you know, when I first came to the program, I was replacing one unhealthy dependence with a healthy dependency on AA. I was wrong. AA does not encourage dependency. It encourages the development of this emotional sobriety. Emotional sobriety is based on autonomy, not dependency. It's based on learning to take care of yourself, to stand on your own two feet. Not that you don't need anyone. It means that you now take responsibility to get the help you need. That's part of what a mature person does. If we don't know how, then we go ahead and we turn to someone that can help us develop that capacity or that skill. Once we start to cut off these faulty emotional dependencies, what happens is we begin the process of differentiation or self-actualization. So what happens is, is that as soon as you weaken the obstructive forces of the false self, right? We're going to say the false self is a self that is all based on a system of emotional dependency. The false self was designed to manipulate our environment to continue to take care of us. This is an important realization to make. As soon as we weaken the forces of that false self in our life, then the constructive forces of our real self, which is now connected to this process of differentiation or self-actualization, begin to take over our lives and start to move us forward as no one could have anticipated. And those of you that have been around the program long enough have seen that miracle happen in many, many people's lives. We don't just go back to what's in medicines called our pre-morbid level of functioning, pre-morbid meaning before the disease occurred in our life. We become much healthier. We become, we now start to realize our potential. And for most of us, our life looks incredibly different once we get into program than before we came. Doesn't happen for everyone, but for most people it does. When we experience this, now we experience what he called this freedom to love, as Francis did. It's an unconditional love. We show up with an unconditional consciousness in our life. We are not hooking attaching strings to everything that we do. So now emotional instinctual satisfactions were the dividend of having love, offering love, and expressing love appropriate to each relation of life. We also don't have this idea that we've got to feel the same way about everyone. We're able to differentiate. Some people we're going to be closer to than others, and that's okay. It's an amazing experience that we have. Plainly, I could not avail myself to God's love until I was able to offer it back to him by loving others as he would have me. And I couldn't possibly do that so long as I was victimized by false dependencies. For my dependencies meant demand, a demand for the possession and control of the people and the conditions surrounding me. While those words absolute dependence may look like a gimmick, they were the ones that helped to trigger my release into my present degree of stability and quietness of mind, qualities which I am now trying to consolidate by offering love to others, regardless of the return to me. So I am a Gestalt therapist, and as a Gestalt therapist, I like to create experiments for people to try different things on to see what they what experience they have during the experiment. So here's the experiment for today. I want you to take this sentence, starting with 
uh and i want instead of saying a i say i demand the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding me so i want you to say that out loud to yourself right now i demand the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding me i want you to say it out loud and I want you to sit with what you experience when you say that. So do it a few times. I demand the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding me. Is there a part of you that feels bad when you say that? Like you shouldn't be that way? Is there a part of you that denies it? Oh, no, no, I'm not like that at all. Is there a part of you that just accepts that that's part of who you are? What is your experience when you say this? This is an important, an important revelation, an important experience for you to develop emotional sobriety. That you need to own this if you're going to be able to unhook yourself, as Bill is talking about. If you are not able to be honest with yourself and see that you demand the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding you, you're never going to be able to develop emotional sobriety. What we know today is that when you can own how strongly your behavior is being determined by forces that sometimes are outside of your awareness, I should say mostly outside of your awareness, sometimes within your awareness, when you can own that is when you start to feel freedom. It's the opposite of what we think. In order to let go of being demanding and possessive and controlling, I need to own how demanding, possessive, and controlling I am. Once I own that, then I have a chance of letting it go. If I don't own it, I can never let it go. If you did not own your powerlessness over alcohol, you could never find recovery. I see people struggling with that all the time that are in relapse. They still think that they can control their drinking or if it's drugs other than alcohol, their the drug use. It's once we owned completely our powerlessness that we were able to discover another power. Once you completely own how demanding, possessive and controlling you are, You've got a chance to let it go. If you have trouble owning that, ask yourself, what is causing that trouble? What part of you doesn't want to see this? What part of you says, no way, this isn't me. Talk to that part of you. Get to know the part of you that's that's resisting this admission. Because therein will lie your freedom. It's to understand what's going on that's making you resist the, the truth of this. This was very hard for me to see early in my recovery. The, the more time I was in the program, in fact, it probably was around the same time Bill started to write about this stuff about 20 years into his journey is when I saw how um, much truth there was to this. And it was a weird thing before my self-esteem seemed to be based on living up to an ideal. Now my self-esteem is much more grounded in authenticity <clears throat> instead of these ideas about how I should be. I feel good about myself when I'm being real and true and honest with myself rather than playing some game. Of course, I haven't offered you a really new idea, only a gimmick that has started to unhook several of my own hexes at depth. Nowadays, my brain no longer races compulsively in either elation, grandiosity, or depression. I've been given a quiet place in bright sunshine. Unhook. 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 Just think of your emotional dependency as creating a hook that you try to hook people with, you try to hook life with, you try to control life with, you try to possess life with. Emotional sobriety is about unhooking <clears throat> our own hexes at depth.
when he says in depth, because some of this stuff is quite unconscious, you're not going to realize that you have some of these things until you start to explore your disturbance. Bill said it's a spiritual axiom that every time I'm disturbed, no matter the cause, there's something wrong with me. I like to think there's something off with me instead of wrong, but it's the same idea. And I and what I've discovered is when I start to dig into that, I see that there's some expectation and, and underneath that expectation is this unhealthy dependence. This I'm okay if attitude. I'm a big fan of Ernie Larson. Ernie Larson talked about stage two recovery. Stage two recovery is dependent or contingent on emotional sobriety. You can't have stage two recovery without having emotional sobriety. Ernie never tied that up in the way that I'm I'm connecting that today, but I think it's 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 it follows. Everything he's talking about is what Bill was talking about in terms of emotional sobriety. He goes on to say that dealing with the mountain of living is what stage two recovery is all about. It's also what emotional sobriety is all about, dealing with the mountain of living. It is about getting on with life by facing those patterns and habits and attitudes that control your life. I demand the possession and control of the people and conditions surrounding me. That's what we're looking at in terms of our emotional sobriety and which for per, per and which for perhaps the first time you are clear headed enough or emotionally sound enough to face. So there is Alan and there is Susie hanging by the strings. Oh my God, what are these strings? See, we walk around thinking we're in control of our life, but the truth of it is our behavior, until we become conscious and start to look at these things, we are puppets on the end of these strings. My emotional dependency. You know, if you do things the way I want you to do, then I'm fine. I'll be able to move in the direction I want. If not, then I'm jerked and I'm spastic. I look all out of shape and I'm, I don't know how to get a hold of myself. All these should demands. I put in here the man rules and the woman rules. We all have these rules that are based on our society about how men are supposed to be, how women are supposed to be, how a man's supposed to behave, how a woman's supposed to behave. You know, all of those rules, you know, some of them, you may want to keep some of them, but if they are not looked at, then they control your life unconsciously. Cultural expectations, the same thing. I could, if I had more strings, I would have put up trauma experiences in your life. All of these forces. Now, if anyone tries to nail this down to one thing, like to focus on trauma, they're just getting one of the strings. Our behavior is so much more complex. There's never going to be just one thing that's happening that's shaped who you are. There's so many different forces in your life. So, I want to present a psychology of emotional sobriety that's inclusive of all of that, that's not exclusive, that all of that work can be integrated into this model, the work of T.N. Dayton, Claudia Black, you know, Basil Vanderkoek, you know, your, your, what does it say, your body keeps score, beautiful book, but also stuff like Viktor Frankl's work. You know, Fritz Perl's work. There's so much out there. Let's not close the doors on anything. Let's bring it all in and see what relevance it might have for our lives. And that's what I do. That's the kind of work I do is try to integrate and synthesize all of this information. And we will be continuing that today with talking about living a purposeful life. But we're going to start by looking at some of Rollo May's work. Rollo May was what we would call a existential um, psychotherapist, um, also very much part of the humanistic psychology movement in the United States, what we call the third wave, the first wave of psychology being behaviorism, and then um, psychoanalysis was the second wave, 
some kind of people reverse it and say psychoanalysis was one and behaviorism number two. It doesn't really matter to me. But what matters is that the third wave was very different than the first two waves. The third wave was about possibilities, about what was right about us, not what was wrong with us. Now, we're going to look today at Rollo May's understanding of our personality and what our personality does. So what he says here is incredibly insightful. He says the source of personality problems. So personality problems, just think about any time that you're upset about what's going on in your life and what's happening for you and how you're dealing with it, right? That's personality problems. Is the lack of the adjustment of tensions within the personality. The lack of adjustments of tensions within the personality. What does he mean by that? When I first read it, it took a while to sit and really contemplate what is he talking about? Well, let's just take two of our instincts, for example. You have an instinct in you that is incredibly strong and powerful that makes you want to cooperate and please. It makes you want to join, to be a part of, to connect. It makes you desire union with another person. You also have an instinct inside of you that is equally as powerful and equally important, and that's the desire to be your own person, to march to your own drum, to express your individuality. To be who you are. I love that old saying with Popeye the Sailor Man. I am what I am on Popeye the Sailor Man. Popeye got it. I am what I am on Popeye the Sailor Man. Now, these two forces can look like they're at odds. But they're only at odds depending on how your family, when you're growing up, and the culture you're in, as well as all kinds of other issues that are going on in your life, told you how to manage the different tension between these two forces. So one part of you, let's say somebody asked you to do something, wanted to cooperate. Another part of you said, I don't want to do it. What did you do with that? How were you met when you said, mom said, all right, I want to get you dressed right now. I don't want to get dressed. Were you shut down? Were you say, well, I don't care what you want. You're going to get dressed anyway. Did your parent negotiate with you? Did your parents say, hey, let, let's let's talk about it in a way where we respect both your, your, your desire not to do it, but yet I want to find a way to get you to cooperate that feels okay for you? Were you met like that? Probably not. <laughs> I mean, every family is going to emphasize one side of that pole or the other. They're going to either say cooperate, I don't really care how you feel, or they're going to say forget about cooperating, just be your own person. Some families are going to be more in the middle where they're struggling with that. But depending on those experiences and then what that meant to you as you were growing up, as you become an adult, there's going to be tension among these two things. If your partner says, hey, I'd love you to do this for me, and you don't want to do it, what do you do with that tension? That's the tension within yourself. How you deal with that, how you deal with the desire to please and cooperate and the, the desire to be your own person is going to determine your level of emotional maturity and your emotional autonomy. When one side of you wins at the expense of the other side of you, you are going to be out of balance. Bill defined emotional sobriety as balance. Well, it's balance within your personality between these different forces in you. A part of you that says yes and a part of you that says no. Let's see what else he says. 
our personality uses the points in the environment, people, places, or things, as nails on which to attach the end threads of the tensions. So, remember we talked about hooking, right? We're hooking things on. So let's say um, I feel this strong desire to please and cooperate, and I don't really listen to myself much. But I'm not owning the fact that I am doing that, that this is a conflict within me. So I project it. So if I'm in a relationship with you and you ask me to do something and I just go ahead and do it and don't question it, I may start getting secretly resentful that you don't care about how I feel. Meaning that, you know, you ask me to do these things for you, but you never ask me how I feel about it. Meaning you're not a very good person. Look at what you're doing to me. You see what I've just done when I do that? I never took the responsibility in that because I projected it onto you and I put my string around that thing about I'm going, I feel this strong desire to please and cooperate, but I don't dare tell you I'm not interested. I am depending on you to make it okay for me to object. So now I make it an unenforceable rule. If you cared about me, that you, when you asked me to do something, you'd also ask me if I really want to do it so that you give me permission to say no. Do you see how I'm hooking myself, how I'm becoming that puppet on a string? I'm waiting for you to make it okay for me to be myself. You can never become yourself if you need permission from another person to be yourself. I will say that again. You will never become who you are if you have to have permission from someone else. If I'm in a relationship with my wife and I'm waiting, it becomes a mother, may I? If it's your husband, it's a papa, may I? Mama, may I go out to play today? Papa, may I go do what I want to do? Well, that's not freedom, is it? That's continuing on with the same problem. What's missing in us when we grow up is what I like to think of as a true north compass. A true north compass is based on an understanding of who you are a clear understanding of what is and what isn't important to you, what you are willing to do and what you aren't. A true north compass points in the direction of I want to or I don't. That's what Dr. Kempler told me in my work with him. He says, Alan, when you become an adult, there's only two reasons to do something because you want to or you don't. He says, it's that damn simple. It's not easy to pull that off, but it's that damn simple. You want to or you don't. Well, do you know what you want? Are you clear about what you want in your life? What's important to you? What your values are? That's what the true North Compass is about, is having a clear sense of yourself. And it will be a flexible sense. It doesn't mean that it's a rigid, that I always must go in that way. But we start that way and being open to the fact that I may change directions when more information is given me or when I consider something from a different point of view. But a true north reflects what's important to you as a person, the kind of person you want to be. Not that your, true, that your idealized self tells you to be, the kind of person you want to be. This takes a lot of work on sorting these things out. This is what Nathaniel Brandon says about it. To live without purpose is to live at the mercy of chance. We have no standard by which to judge what is or is not worth doing. 
See, each moment of my life, I focus on what do I want to do right now? What's important to me in this moment? He goes on to say this, that living without purpose means that our orientation to life is reactive than proactive. I'm waiting for something to come along and make my life whole, to make my life meaningful, to give my life meaning, to make me feel good, to make me feel like I have purpose. He goes self-responsible, or we could say men and women who have achieved a degree of emotional sobriety, do not pass to others the burden of supporting their existence. Take that in for a minute. We do not pass to others the burden of supporting their existence. It's my job to support my existence. Just like it's my job to inhale and exhale. That's my job. That's 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 what differentiation means. That's what growing up means. I take the responsibility to support my existence. I learn to support myself. I learn to tease out what I want, what I don't want. I learn to stand for myself. Emotional sobriety is learning how to stand for yourself, to take care of yourself, to support yourself without impinging on the rights of other people. I'll say that again. Emotional sobriety is about taking care of yourself, supporting yourself, without impinging on the rights of others. This is going to become very much a part of our discussion when we start to explore the 12th essential insight about having healthy relationships. We'll get into that a lot more next time I talk. Now, part of this purpose in our life is to really discover what is going to give our life meaning. And this is Dr. Viktor Frankl. And he had an incredible insight into this. So now, those of you that know of his work, he wrote um, Man's Search for Meaning, probably sold over 7 million copies by now. Um, an incredibly important book for many of the insights that he had. Uh, brilliant man, a uh, great observer of the human dilemma. And, he, and this is what he saw. And this was based on how he saw people dealing with being in, in the Nazi death camps and how they were able to meet that experience in a way that didn't diminish them, but in fact, enhanced their spirituality. And this is what he said. He said, true meaning of life is to be discovered in the world rather than within man or his own psyche. Meaning, this is, he'll go on to clarify it. He has termed this constitutive characteristic the self-transcendence of human existence. It points to the fact that being human almost always points and is directed to something or someone other than oneself. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve or another person to love, the more human he is and the more he actualizes himself. Well, my God, isn't this is what Phil was talking about in step 12? Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to other alcoholics who are still suffering right? And to practice these principles in all our affairs. That's what we're given here. 
is now in recovery, we're tasked to giving what we have received and to helping someone else discover some new possibilities in their life. That's what makes to me the 12 steps a very humanistic approach to life is in order to self-actualize ourselves, our purpose in life now is to be a part of a solution, to be able to bring justice, nobility, a high level of consciousness to our conflicts and to our struggles so that we become a true citizen in, in the most meaningful sense of the word that we don't take from our community, we don't subtract, <clears throat> but now we spend our life making a difference. And we all find it. Some of us have find this in making coffee in the meetings. That's what I did when I first came. For a while, I was treasurer of a meeting. That's the contribution I could make to something outside of myself that was there for helping other people. Today, the contribution I make is trying to carry this message of emotional sobriety, helping people understand it, giving my time, my experience, strength, and hope, and carrying the message that Bill started back in the 1950s. That's my purpose in my life today. What is yours? Now, in my book, which I'd encourage you to read, especially the chapter I'm trying to look for. It. It's over here. There you are. In this chapter, I had I asked my friend Tom, my friend, my, my sponsor, my dear friend Tom, to share his experience with this chapter. And it's an amazing story. You know, it, I, I'd encourage you to read it. But there was one thing that really stood out. This woman that brought him into the program, her name was Flowbird. So if you picture, so Tom has now 53 years in recovery. Um, he went to Hawaii looking for this woman who his friend Tom Catton said was over there. And he said there was something different about her and she might be able to help you. So he didn't know where she lived. He just jumped on a plane, partly motivated to get out of LA. He was in trouble with some drug dealers and knew that they were looking for him. So he jumped on a plane, went to Hawaii, and went to the North Shore where she was staying, but had no idea where she was at. And he gets there, and he gets there early in the morning, and just you know takes his his bag and he's he's his backpack, and he's falls asleep on the beach, and he probably wakes up at about you know early morning. I think Flowbird got there around six a.m. just when the sun is starting to rise, and he looks up at the top of the hill and he sees this woman, and he recognized her from the picture that Tom showed him. And she comes down to the beach and he looks at her and she looks at him and says, are you Flaubert by any chance? And she looks at him and says, I've been waiting for you, honey. <laughs> One of those moments, right? He gets kind of goosebumps all over. She takes him back to his house, to her house where she's staying at. She never owned anything. It was a house that was given her to, to stay at by, by a very wealthy man who was going to eventually do some work on it. But he said, go, you go live there for the next year while you're in Hawaii. And she did. And she created like a halfway house for, for men and women that were struggling with addiction and introducing them to the 12 step way of life. At that point, this was way back in the, in the mid sixties, there was no narcotics anonymous on the island of Oahu. In fact, Narcotics Anonymous was only in a couple states in the United States, in California and New York. And um, so he goes there with her and he's crashing and she's, you know, he falls asleep for 24 hours, wakes up and he goes out in the living room and she's sitting there meditating. And he said, I'm sorry, did I disturb you? She says, no, no, come over here and sit down. And he goes to reach and give her some money for staying there. He says, Slow down, honey, one thing at a time. Tell me about your life. And they started this journey. And I remember at one point, Tom said, I had a feeling that if I could find a way to be that comfortable and that free, that much freedom in, inside myself, then I could really make life work. 
if I could achieve part of what I see Flaubert having. I think what he saw in her was an incredible degree of spirituality and emotional sobriety. And that's what I believe we all want, is this freedom. And that's why this becomes such an important part of our emotional sobriety, because it touches something very deep inside that will help us actualize and differentiate ourselves. But you can see you have to be able to be clear about who you are to be able to start giving things away. There's an emotional sobriety study area that uh, you can learn more about. This is for a nominal fee. None of this money is going to me. It's to support Kristen and the, the whole program. But you get together with me for an hour a month. You get together get with Herb, Tom Potash, who's also going through my book and bringing in a lot of great stuff. It's a really great, great thing. And plus, you have access to all of my DVDs and CDs and stuff like that. Um, here's my contact information, and why I want you to pay attention to this is right now I am planning a trip to Europe in mid-May, and I'm going to be in Dublin probably the last weekend in May, it looks like, to do some workshops on emotional sobriety. So I will be coming there. There also may be a trip to um, the United Kingdom after that, but that's still in the planning. 